Sound check, one, two, three, four. Good morning, dear friends. Medium-sized mammals, followers of the Buddha's way, aspiring arahats. Welcome. And welcome to those of you that are joining us out there in the internet land. It's fun, some of you that I know watch regularly, I have images of you popping up. So as I like to do, to connect us a little bit as we begin, please take a moment, please stay in silence if you wish, but I recommend take a moment and turn to a neighbor and greet them, share your name and something for which you are grateful at this moment. Go. For those of you that have not been introduced to this gong, it weighs 22 pounds. It's a 10 kilo chunk of bra brass. And it was made in Burma, Myanmar now. And it was purchased at the, I can pronounce it, the huge, it's a huge open arm air market in Bangkok, Cheta Chek market. And uh, it took about half a day of hunting, but we finally found it. And, uh, and a couple of other smaller ones like it. I was hunting with my daughter 10 years ago when we had, we had, um, the center was, was, good God, it was more than 15 years ago because the center was a dream still. The, the Buddha, the standing Buddha in the entryway, uh, we came across and we were talking. We'd, we'd had the steering committee and we were thinking maybe and uh, my daughter, who was 16, she was doing a year uh, rotary exchange in Thailand and spoke Thai, which was, she was our guide, sort of. And uh, we saw this standing Buddha, and uh, I thought, well, we should get that. And I, and she, and I said, no, nah, it's just, you know. And she said, get it. Because <laughs> there will be a center, and then uh, it stood in the Dharma Rain Zen Center for three years and then came to be our, our sentinel here at the entrance. And this gong came at the same time. It's shaped, it's shaped like a Buddhist burial mound, like a stupa. 
and it's hollow ground. If you, you can come and look at it. The, so the wings are fat, and then it gets hollow in the middle, and when you hit the wings, it not only spins, but the wings flap, and that's what creates the sound. If you hit it hard, you get Doppler effect, which is and that's what calls to practice in, uh, in Burma. It's outside every meditation hall, there's one of these. And uh, the mythology is that it rings in all the realms, and particularly in the Deva realm, so when you ring it, the whole room fills up with angels. Now, I don't know if that's true, it's a nice image. It also calls the creatures from the hell realms, and the humans, and the dogs, and cats, and cows, and horses. And so there's this pulling of us together. So it's not just a bell. It's, it's, it's got a whole mythology. <laughs> Incidentally, while I remember, we had a wonderful retreat yesterday, the, the uh, stewardship circle retreat, and in the kitchen, as I was leaving, I thought these were my gloves, they're not. So if they're yours, they're here. They're small. Otherwise, I would have kept them, no. <laughs> now I have nice gloves. <sighs> Funny, isn't it, the mind? Refuge, oh, who's here for the first time? One, two, three. Anybody else, no? Four. Welcome. We will chant the refuge in the Buddha Dharma Sangha. We'll do a guided meditation. Jim will do some movement. Avi will do some, some uh, the announcements. I will give a talk and some conversation with you. And then at one o'clock, we're having our annual presentation of, what are we calling it? The story of Scrooge at 1.30. And there's a potluck. So it's a busy time. If you didn't bring food for the potluck, you can still come because there's always plenty. Okay. So, refuge in the Buddha Dharma Sangha. What does that mean? Refuge in being awake, in what we discover when we're awake, and community is the need for each other to practice. I take refuge in the Buddha, the one who shows me the way in this life. Namo Buddhaya, Namo Buddhaya, Namo Buddhaya. I take refuge in the Dharma, the way of understanding and love. Namo Dharmaya, Namo Dharmaya, Namo Dharmaya. Refuge in the Sangha. A community of mindful harmony. Namo Sangaya, Namo Sangaya, Namo Sangaya. Pausing a moment, let's do them again and really be aware of the vibration in your chest, in your heart and also the meaning of it, to take refuge in being awake, like right now, seeing and knowing it. And then, in this moment, what's revealed? This experience, the Dharma, and then Sangha is our community. So, this, so the chanting, the singing itself is a mindfulness practice. I take refuge in the Buddha, the one who shows me the way in this life. Namo Buddhaya, Namo Buddhaya, Namo Buddhaya. I take refuge in the Dharma. The way of understanding and love. No 
namo dharmaya namo dharmaya namo dharmaya i take refuge in the sangha the community of mindful harmony namo sangaya namo sangaya namo sangaya I received this poem this morning. When I die, give what's left of me away to children and old men that wait to die. If you need to cry, cry for your brother walking the street beside you. When you need me, put your arms around anyone and give them what you need to give me. I want to leave you something, something better than words or sounds. Look for me in the people I have known or loved, and if you cannot give me away, at least let me live on in your eyes and not in your mind. You can love me most by letting hands touch hands, by letting bodies touch bodies, and by letting go of children that need to be free. Love doesn't die, people do. So when all that's left of me is love, give me away. This practice, like any real spiritual training, is all about love. The love that allows a human being to pay attention to themselves, to embrace ourselves, to really, to really turn in fullness toward our own life experience. And our lives really are difficult, aren't they? The very first utterance from the Buddha after his awakening was there is suffering. Suffering is woven into the fabric of human life. And how could that not be? Because everything this side of the Big Bang, the Great Flash, the cataclysm of universe birth, everything on this side of that is one constant change after another. In a whole lifetime of human birth, we never arrive anywhere. We never get somewhere and then get to set up housekeeping and stay.
Some years ago, I worked in a hospice program as a social worker. For two or three years, I met many, many people in Clackamas County who'd been married for 60 years or more. And there they were facing one of them leaving. So whether it's catching, catching someone's eye on the bus or welcoming a new puppy into our life or sitting at a deathbed, we're always part of a, uh, an extraordinarily complex dance during which time we get to affect each other. We get to, we get to touch each other. We get to change each other's destinies. And so it behooves us to come to ourselves with as much love as we can and openness. And then from that to, to leave behind us in the world like a, like a ship or a boat leaves a wake behind it, to leave our wake being one of touching and kindness, touching and love, touching and respect. So one could say we come here today to sit here and love particularly ourselves. And if that's our intention, it means that everything that arises, whatever mental states, impulses, moods, perceptions, memories, plans, emotions, whatever arises, I aspire to accept myself in this moment exactly as I am. Meditation is not really about self-improvement, though one's personality can become more harmonious and emotions become more workable. The real task of meditation is freedom. Freedom from identification with all this that causes suffering. So please, why not take a sort of vow that for this next 30, 40 minutes, I aspire to love and accept myself exactly as I am. And so we find a body that sits here and it's full of life You can notice that it touches the cushion or the floor, pressure. It breathes. At this moment there are whales surfacing, blowing out carbon dioxide and sucking in huge volumes of oxygen and then diving down again. Hummingbirds are breathing. We belong to the family of breathers. So why not participate really fully and be aware of this communion, taking communion 
with our common atmosphere. The conditioned mind, the mind of the trance of everyday life, has many activities it likes to do. Thinking, planning, remembering, arguing, storytelling. They're all normal for a human mind. But we get rather hypnotized into believing they're true. And there's something in us much deeper, infinitely deeper than those thoughts and emotions, which is the Buddha, that which knows, that which is awake. So knowing that moment when breathing in begins. When we embrace our humanness fully, more fully, we can notice even before the breath starts that there's a kind of preparation or a kind of intention for it. There's a hunger for breath. And then it starts. And then it rises to fullness, comes to its own natural slowing down and then stopping, and then it naturally breathes out. At some point, the breathing out reaches its <coughs> ending. And then there's just quiet. There's still the sensations of the body being alive. And then breathing in starts again. In the same way that the breath starts, thoughts start. Out of nowhere, thoughts suddenly emerge.
The human mind is a thought generating system. This propensity to create thoughts is one of the main reasons for our extraordinary dominance on the planet because the mind creates a future image, imagination, and then plans for how to make it happen or not happen. We can call this worry when it gets out of control. The Buddha discovered that awareness, mindfulness, presence is deeper than all of this conjecture and thought. So we take refuge in that which is awake. So we sit and embrace breathing. We observe how thoughts arise and then they are illuminated by mindfulness. And then we go back to the breath.
humans quite naturally and wisely pay a lot of attention to the world around us. It's complicated, requires a great deal of attention and planning and strategy. And relationships are complicated as well. So we often, mostly, neglect our inner lives. Our attention is to seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, the body, getting our needs met, exerting our will in the world. This other pull, this turning inward and assuming a position of intense action through observation, great curiosity, taking the mind, taking the thoughts and emotions as objects of observation of the highest importance. Studying what we take to be, each of us, our personality, our personness. This is a rare activity and a life and world transforming one. Each breath is an invitation to come home to the body. To rest in the present moment.
Please be awake to the nature of your inner experience right now. The mind could be clear, quiet, spacious, accepting, loving. Or it could be contracted into desire, wanting, or dissatisfaction and disliking, aversion. It could be engaged in the trance of worry or planning or remorse, restlessness, or of sleepy dullness, sloth and torpor. Or it could be doubting. Why am I doing this? Can I do this? Or it could be colored, filled with any emotion. Anything's possible. See if it's workable, doable, to love what's here right now, <coughs> no matter whether it's pleasant or unpleasant, pleasure or pain. Opening to what is now. How one enters meditation, formal practice, is significant. Just as how one moves on to the next form of practice is important. Oftentimes, people use a gong to end meditation. It's helpful, symbolic. Another way would go like this, which is to realize that in the next minute or two, you're invited to notice how it is to form the intention to let your eyes open. Maybe before that, to notice how your body is hungering to move a little bit, to stretch. But don't stretch unconsciously or in the way you always stretch. Really investigate. What is this tension or aching? Or how does this intention to move and stretch occur? And then let it happen. But don't abandon the presence with it. And then notice the intention to let the eyes open. They don't open by themselves, it takes effort. And notice then, be aware of seeing, seeing.
Meditation is a practice we do. And that we then continue to do in our daily activities until awareness is spontaneous and continuous with no effort. It's like learning an instrument. At first we play scales and we move very slowly to be sure we don't develop bad habits. And And it takes a lot of brain, it takes a lot of bandwidth to get in, like with the guitar, to get the fingers in the right shape, or on the piano, to get, it takes a lot of repetition. But then, over time, for people who truly master the instrument, there's no attention to that at all. There's just what's emerging in the moment of improvisa improvisation. So we, s we do this sitting, breathing. In a few moments, we'll do some movement. I suggest, don't abandon being aware. It's not like meditation's over now. Mindful movement is the, is the perfect accompaniment to mindful sitting. And I invite you to stay for the morning. If it is, however, time for you to go, some people s often leave at this point, don't go unconsciously. When your hand touches that brass plate on the door back there, really notice touching. As you put on your clothing, really become aware of putting on your clothing. There's no rush. Or if there is a rush, notice you're in a rush. And then there's the crash bars out there. One of the things I learned when we got the building was, by law, a place like this has to have doors that can open at all times. That's what the crash bar is about. So when you hit it, when you put your hands on it, do that really mindfully and then push and feel as the door unlocks and then open. And then there's that blast of cold and so on. The intention of mindfulness practice is continuity. And obviously we lose it for long periods of time, but then we wake up, all right, right. I'm halfway home and I was driving completely unconsciously. How interesting. So, Mr. Dalton, are you Good to go. Releasing. Mm. So feeling our connection with the earth through the bottoms of our feet, rocking back a little forward and back, waking up the toes and heels and instep. And opening up the hands and, and gesturing just a tiny bit with a index finger and the thumb just opening <laughs> opening a little bit wider <laughs> who is that strange man <laughs> <coughs> the tiger <laughs> opening its mouth embracing the whole world right just Sometimes hard to be steady in mindfulness with your friends around. 
When I first started meditating with this man, I had a little bench. And we, after we meditated for a while, we'd walk around and I'd come back and the bench would be gone. <laughs> <coughs> All right, so the tiger's mouth. See how little effort it takes to separate those two fingers and then as your hand moves through space, your mindfulness of that space between the two fingers continues. It's a familiar move for many of us to, to go through these gestures called shibashi, form one. But it's the first time we've done it with this awareness now. It's the first time we've opened our arms. Continuing awareness. All the stages of opening and sinking. Remembering those two fingers moving apart. And opening overhead, continuing to remember. This is the feeling of the fingers moving a tiny bit apart. Then the relief, when we release the arms, how do the shoulders feel, crossing the wrists, opening the tiger's jaw, and then the tiger opens to the side, separating clouds. Then it gets a little more complicated. Opening to the side, the tiger's draw at each at the end of each arm, one hand pushing, the other pulling, the hips moving. Also mindful of the central axis. We're rotating around an axis, axis from the top of the head to a space between the heels. And both hands open to the back and overhead. Whoops, hi there. <laughs> and the mood changes with large movements, offering a piece of fruit to the sun. There's a woman downtown at the Chinese gardens that teaches shibashi with offering the fruit to the sun. And then she says, it's hard to be grumpy when you're offering fruit to the sun. Turning, gazing at the moon. Now the Tiger's jaws back. (laughs) 
pressing across. And then cloud hands, reach across, focus on the upper hand and let the other hand follow like a shadow on the earth, and then switch. Continuing to remember that space between the thumb and the index finger. Awareness can incorporate all sorts of mind moments. Fingers, shoulders, feet, hips. Then releasing the arms again, stepping out and splashing in the sea. Feel the weight move forward and the weight move back. <coughs> sensation of lifting the toes off the floor when we move back, riding the waves, feeling the palms stretch the tendons, then relax and stretch. Opening the arms, palms up, feeling the Turning of the wrist, opening, turning down. Awareness is very plastic and integrating. It takes lots of different things and pulls them together. Now, come to stillness. Awareness can be absolutely still. And then stepping out again. Splashing in the sea. Opening to the rhythm of life. Riding the waves. Stretching. Relaxing. Opening, palms up, palms down. Back to the center, feeling that stillness again. Fingers still have a distance between them. Now we're going to make a fist and disappear the tiger and move to the dragon. The tiger is the yin energy. It's always in touch with the earth and the dragon flies. It's always in touch with the sky. And then opening the wings, you can fly with the cranes. Up on the toes, there's a launching. And turning the wheel. Feeling the fluidity of all the different tendons and muscles that have to cooperate to form a wheel in our imagination. Turning the other direction. And back to the center. <clears throat> we'll lift one arm and one leg like we're bouncing a ball. 
again, the fluidity of all the different joints, and tendons, ligaments, muscles, nerves, all cooperating, more or less. <laughs> Some days they don't do very well. And then the simple centering breath, drawing energy up from the earth, releasing what we don't need, freely letting go, facing the next moment, new energy, and letting go. The rhythm continues. And coming to stillness. And then recalling that I'm going to be here next Saturday doing this, alternating between meditation and uh, in a s sitting position and then movement. We'll explore Qigong as a healing energy for four hours. So if you're interested in that, see you next Saturday. Thank you very much. <laughs> Won't let go. Here it is. <laughs> you know what? It's something to do with flaps on my pockets. Oh, yeah. Good morning, Sangha. Can, can you hear me okay? My name is Avi, and I am community coordinator here, and we are going to do the very ancient ritual of announcements. Whenever I do these announcements, I am honoring the spirit of the very first announcement at the very first Dharma gathering, which I believe was Will whoever left their cow by the front of the hut move at its block in the doorway? We continue that tradition thousands of years later. So um, I believe that Kirsten has something she wants to say about a class. Hi. Um, so I'm Kirsten. I'm the volunteer coordinator here, but I also co-teach the nonviolent communication classes here with Doyle. Um, and we have our next class starting up on January 19th. Registration is open for that online. And uh, it's a 10-week class. It starts with an all-day retreat that Saturday, and it'll be Tuesday night, 7 to 9. If you want to know more about that, you can come talk to me. Or there are a lot of people who've taken this class who are here today. Raise your hand if you've taken the NVC class. Talk to those people about what it's like, because they're a good source of information for that. Um, so thank you, and I hope to have some of you in the class this time. Thank you, Kirsten. So, um, I've got a mindfulness exercise for all of us. You know how at the end of every Dharma talk, we always put all the chairs and the cushions away. Today we're gonna do something different. Today we are gonna leave them all in place because we've got our production of Scrooge that's gonna be happening about, uh, at about 1.30. So, <laughs> rather, than, rather than mindlessly putting everything away, let's mindfully leave everything the way that it is. <laughs> Um, I'm going to run down through these things. There is a lot going on. We've got the performance of Scrooge at 1.30. It's family friendly. Uh, it is a wonderful parable about the benefits of community and generosity. We also have our potluck today. People have brought out their, their secret family recipes. Please join us even if you have brought nothing. There's plenty to go around. Then on Wednesday, December 12th, we've got the December edition of our new NVC practice group. If you have any experience at all with nonviolent communication and you want to practice talking giraffe, please uh, look at the website. The information is there. On Saturday, December 15th, we have our December edition of Buddhist Movie Night, which will be I Heart Huckabees, which is a really quirky movie if you haven't seen it. Um, Saturday, December 15th, earlier in the day from 10 to 2, as Jim was saying, he's got um, his half-day Qigong retreat. If you love what he did for 10 minutes, you'll love what he does for four hours. Then on Saturday, January 5th, we've got our first Saturday uh, monthly day-long retreat at PIMC. We have those the first Saturday of every month. Then on Sunday, January 6th, 
Uh, we've got the monthly orientation with Robert. Um, then on uh, the first week of January, January 1 through 6 or 4 through 6, Robert is holding his Brighton Bush retreat. Uh, if you are interested in that, please call Brighton Bush to see if they have any openings. Oh, it's full. Never mind. The Brighton Bush retreat is full. Better luck next time. Um, then on Sunday, uh, let's see. Then on Sunday, also January 6th, we've got um, a visiting teacher, Orin J. Sofer, who is the author of Say What You Mean, A Mindful Approach to Nonviolent Communication. We'll be doing an NVC workshop here after the Dharma gathering. Um, that is on January 6th, and we are very pleased to have him here. He's quite well known in the NVC community, and there will be details on that in the website coming up soon. On, on Saturday, January 12th, uh, we've got a visiting teacher, Frank Letter, is going to be doing a day long on patience and loving kindness, and this day long is going to be dedicated to Frank and Robert's teacher, Ruth Dennison, and details will be on the website soon. Sunday, January 13th, there will be another one of our second Sunday PIMC potlucks. Um, on Sunday, January 13th, will be the next Engaging the Dharma meeting for this Sangha making decisions about how we want to take what we are learning on the cushion and putting it out into the community in terms of mindful action out in the world. Uh, on Thursday, January 17th, We've got the start of the winter 2019 basics of mindfulness class. Registration is open. On Tuesday, January 22nd, we've got the start of the winter 2019 skillful speech class that Kirsten was just talking about. Registration is now open. And then on January uh, 26th, on Saturday, uh, we will have a volunteer retreat with Robert. If you want to attend and you have not volunteered or do not volunteer, well, it's very simple. Just simply volunteer. Talk to Kirsten or me, become a volunteer, and you're welcome to attend. Some other things. Um, we, um, we have really experienced an explosion of interest in our community over the last year or so, and we've got a lot of things going on. In order to keep pace with the way that people use this community, we could really use more input, both in terms of Donna, uh, your contributions, um, and we could also use some more volunteers to get some things done. And of course, volunteering here is really about getting to know one another and balancing that against the reality of the fact that there are some things that need to be done to care for this place so it's welcoming when we come here. So if you feel called to volunteer, you feel called to put some energy into this community because you love what this does to your life, and you love being here, well then please contact me or Kirsten and we will fix you up because we can use any one of you, we can use all of your skills and all of your, all of your effort. We, have, um, we do have some volunteer needs. We need people to, we need someone to coordinate gardening in the spring. We need a couple of people for the housekeeping team to keep this place looking good. We need some people for the live stream camera team. And um, we need a fix it person. We need somebody who can take care of stuff when it breaks. If you have an interest in doing any of these, please contact Kirsten or me. If you want to engage in this community at a deeper level, please volunteer. Uh, we also have uh, a number of other sits during the week. They're smaller, more intimate. Uh, if you'd like to experience that, there's details on the website. We have spiritual friends groups that meet on their own schedule in neighborhoods. People gather in each other's homes and they talk about the Dharma, they read books, they practice together. If you're interested in joining one of those, please look at the website. We also have an ongoing project where we donate small household items to the Transitions Project. That's what that pile over there is. If you have things you don't need, anything you don't need can be used by a homeless person who needs to get their lives back on track. Um, they do amazing work at, at the Transitions Project. And then finally, uh, we do Dharma consults. Jim, are you available? Uh, Jim is available for Dharma consults today after the Dharma talk for 20 minutes. Um, if you have an issue in your practice or you want to start a practice and you've never had one, Jim would be happy to help you with that. If you don't have time today or you can't do it today, please contact me and I will set you up with one of the members of the Teachers Council and they would be happy to meet with you. And then. As always, I'm available here during the week in the mornings. If you have any questions about how to access this place or want to know more about what's going on or you have something you want to contribute, please, by all means, call me. 
I uh, hope you all have a happy Hanukkah, those of you who observe it, and blessings to you all today. Thank you for being here. I remember hiding your chair. That was fun. I'd completely lost track of that. I think you got me back in a variety of ways. I don't know, is that a kind of guy humor? Is that just... I, I remember I, I had a best friend some years ago, his name was Bob Braun. For 13 years we were really close friends. We played racquetball every Friday morning and then had lunch. It was just a standing date. And we would hide each other's underwear. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow or another you know, you'd have lockers side by side and just... And so it just never ceased to be funny, which I think... <laughs> Which I think is really pretty childish. <laughs> <laughs> that was a nice experience having him for that time. He was a rolfer, body worker, and um, we met at a conference and he wanted to learn to meditate and I certainly needed body work and we it turned into this incredible friendship. We taught weekend workshops together. And, and then he died. He had a stroke. Poof, gone. I think he was the first human being I was with when he died. No. Yeah. Kind of amazing. So here we are. I wanted to say something about community and, and sp specifically about volunteering and the needs that we have, but also about how about how Sangha, community, you know, we take this refuge, I take refuge in Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, and it's not, the refuges aren't, I take refuge in Buddha, awakeness and Dharma and what's discovered and the, the, the teachings and so on, but there's a, this equally important Sangha piece. And we're not so good at Sangha in our culture. Um, we live very isolated lives, which were created this, this mobility thing was actually created for the benefit of industry so that we could be moved. Remember the, there's the old saying, IBM is I've been moved. But we have, we have these notions that it's normal to, at some or in any stage in our life, to just pick up and move to a different city and start over. I certainly did. I mean, I, I left Montreal and traveled for almost six years, 
and then uh, wound up here via California, Toronto, California. Um, but I know I have friends who have been retiring of late, and a couple of them have picked up and gone, gone to the sun. How sensible. <laughs> but I can't imagine doing that. To pick up and leave behind the richness of relatedness and the, of the history of friendships and the interconnection and the, the interdependence with each other. That would be so, I just have, I have, I have difficulty imagining it. Um, yeah, I know in my travels I, I, hit, I did a lot of hitchhiking, lots, thousands of rides actually, through, went to Asia overland from Europe and all around Australia and New Zealand and Europe, Southeast Asia. And one of, the, one of the really strange things is that, that we do in this culture is people buy these giant boxes on wheels and then that's their life. Very interesting, odd to me. The superficiality of relatedness. But, but here, here why, why I'm speaking in this way um, We set out, Jim and Doug, Pullen and I, and all the people who've helped along the way. We set out to create community here. And the, the vision is cradle to grave. And we've had baby blessings here, and we've had marriages happen here, and divorces and deaths and uh, sicknesses, serious illnesses. And, and uh, the idea is to create a place where we can support each other in being conscious through major life transitions and through celebrating life and so on. I'm so appreciative. Today we're going to have the play that you've, you're bringing to us for the kids and for all of us, the kids and all of us. Um, and when I speak of this, I always, I always remember this long time ago, <clears throat> a long time ago, it would be 29 years ago, I was with my, the mother of my children and my kids. The kids were eight and four. My daughter was a beautiful blonde four-year-old in Bali, and her name was, is Tara, which is the name of the goddess in Bali. And so when th they were just so amazed by her hair to begin with. And you know, four-year-olds, so charming. But uh, and they would say, Tala, Tala. But, and she would, we'd always find her sitting on some woman's lap. Such, such is the nature of Bali. That in fact, one day she went missing. Our experience was she went missing and uh, started to freak out a bit because we were on the beach. and. And uh, I went to the village, it was a fishing village nearby, and there she was, sitting in some woman's lap. <laughs> <laughs> but, to the point, there was this fellow that I knew from a previous time in Bali, and he was, uh, he was guiding us, sort of, and he invited us to his village one night, the village of Penastanan, outside of Ubud. Dark, no electricity, or very little electricity. And through the evening, there was gamelan music playing and so on. Through the evening, he constantly was touching people's hands. Hi, 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 hi. And um, as he walked us back through the dark night, back to our hotel, I asked him, how many of those people do you know? And he, with a sort of surprise, said, well, all of them, of course. And then he corrected himself, no, there's a, there's a group of young people who are now 15 or 17. I was working as a teacher in another part of the island, and I wasn't here for their, ba baby's feet touched the ground for the first time at six months. The babies don't get a name until they're six months old. 
and they touch their feet to the ground and then they get a name and then there's a whole, they become part of the community. And, and, I, and I pursued it a little bit. I said, you really know everybody? He said, well, of course I know everybody. This is my community. Hundreds of people. And, the life, of course, the life of the village was, was based around the temple. And, of course, they all lived within walking distance. We have this distant thing, this automobile thing that makes it more challenging. But, something has happened here over these years. There's a lot of, there's a lot of friendships that are formed. There's quite a web of interrelatedness through different groups and so on. And one of the ways that one becomes part of is the recipro reciprocity of generosity with each other. And sometimes we're hesitant to do that. Oh gosh, if I, borrow, if I ask this person for help, then I'm going to owe them. That's relationship. Not owing like you owe me, but... Well, you came over and helped me when my, you know, my kid was sick and so on, so I think I'll, make, I'll go out of my way to come and help you when your mother is dying or whatever. And so that, that's the context, the, the vision of this ongoing request that we have. We really do need some help running PIMC. We need help supporting it financially. You, you received a thing in the email, if you're on the email list or get the mail, the mailings. Uh, we're doing an end of year campaign. And we don't have a specific amount in mind, but we, we run, PIMC runs at a, um, our, our treasurer, uh, Doug Ross, says, says, this isn't the way to run a business. <laughs> because with the renters downstairs and with the donations from you folks, uh, at the end of the year, it, it, it sort of balances, but there isn't, there, isn't, um, there, isn't an, there isn't enough to do things we'd like to do. So I encourage you to, if, if, if this is important to you, and I know I'm in such a privileged position, I've met so many people who've come to me and said, PIMC has changed my life. And if it changes one's life, then why not support it really, really lavishly? Because other people, come, people come through the door with great frequency and they're lost, right? They've been in religious organizations that, that were either helpful or unhelpful. Uh, and maybe their lives are in turmoil or uproar or dissolution. And uh, people walk through the doors, and I also hear from many people, some of whom I see in the group right now, who get here and then say, I finally found my home. Now that's kind of nice, kind of nice providing a home base for people. So if this, if this touches you, uh, I encourage you, find some way to participate in, in, the div in the maintenance of the place. So small, little small things can really help. Um, and it doesn't need to be a lifetime commitment. <laughs> it can just be for a few months or a few weeks even. And probably some of you have particular skills that would be very useful to an organization that needs infrastructure. And uh, you could approach Avi with that. And uh, we had the, the, the retreat we had yesterday was for people, at, who, members of this <laughs> stewardship circle. I always want to go to sustaining circle from NPR. Um, and uh, there were 23 of us. It was a nice collection of people. And what that is, is that you sign up to make a monthly donation of some amount. And... Uh, there's belonging in it. The, the places that we belong are the places that we participate. And to the degree we participate, we get woven into the fabric. So come and have potluck too so we can connect in that way.
Our stated goal as an organization is the complete elimination of human suffering. <laughs> and we'll add in all beings, just why not? And then one step more practicable. Our goal is to create a place where human beings are mission to support human beings in practice. In becoming this, this dawning notion, I, th I think I want to meditate. And supporting people in learning what is meditation really, and of helping us move to a place where meditation becomes really the central post in our lives. And then that leads to all kinds of transformation the development of compassion and kindness and service. And, um, and so that's when, when I contemplate, well, what, what should I talk about today? It always comes back to, how can, how can I inspire people to do the difficult work of stopping, making time, and facing into what's really happening in your person and in your life. And the, the in the the usual talk about meditation, the 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 advertising about meditation, it really leaves out how hard it is. You know, imagine <laughs> How attractive would it be? Come to meditate and discover that life's really a lot more difficult than you really <laughs> than you, than you, that there, there are ways you've been glossing over how difficult it is with your addictions and preoccupation with the phone. And so come and give all that up and suffer consciously. <laughs> oh, and make large donations too. <laughs> <laughs> but you'll have friends, you'll have morbid friends. <laughs> yeah, life suffering. <laughs> but it's, it is, there's a way that's true, isn't it? That when we really take, when, when we stop skiff, skittering along on the surface and we turn inward, we discover that there's a lot of heartache and there's, there's this... Um, Nagging insecurity, because life really is insecure. And that th th then there's this commitment, and community helps support this. There's then this commitment to actually, well, you know, since I'm seeing how life really is, I'm going to really see if these teachings are true, and that I can become a lot happier and more confident, and th that I can face the big waves that are coming really with more humor and more compassion and kindness and, and can act, in, like in my family, I can be a source of support and encouragement rather than skittering around trying to get satisfaction through, through consuming. So I want to ask you now, what do you need to know about in this moment? Do you have a question? Does your practice pose a question for you? How can I help? And in order to get that known, all you have to do is take this. This is a hand-me-down from the Buddha. Yeah. Test one, two, yeah, it works. So help us, what do you need? And not all at once, please. Tia, please say your name. My name is Tia. Um, I find that we, I, miss out on joy a lot if I am not awake. 
And we talk about compassion a lot and how be, being compassionate to each other is a way to feel and see where someone else is coming from and to be able to, to put yourself in their shoes and, and understand that they're right, you're right, everybody's right. And we often talk about and think about compassion as um, feeling someone's pain because there's so much pain out there. But what we forget about is that there's so much joy out there, but we don't let it out. And what I would like to hear about and talk about a little bit more is how we can be compassionate and revel in each other's joy. Good luck. <laughs> well, that would be a bummer, wouldn't it? To hang out being joyful with each other? I was talking with one of our community members yesterday about the fact that we, it's been a year or more since we had a dance. So we're gonna pull that one together. And, and a, uh, also a, uh, a talent night. We've done a couple of those and that's, that's really fun. So joy in the Joy is a real place in Dharma teachings and practice. There's a, I really know a lot about depression. I suffer from depression most of my life. Certainly, well, I, I took uh, SSRIs, antidepressant medication, until about 10 years ago, for at least 10 or 12 years. And it was a miracle when I finally took it. And it, it, for me, it worked. It helped a lot. But uh, in fact, I, I, had, I had, as a psychotherapist, I had referred many people to physicians for medication workups, uh, but uh, I never took myself there. And I was talking to one of my psychiatrist friends and I said something about not feeling so good and she, she uh, kind of took me by the scruff of the neck and said, Robert, we have a name for this. It's called anxious depression. You have it. And I said, but well, you know, I, I'm not really suicidal. And she said, you dummy, you don't have to be suicidal to be depressed. It can just be a mood disorder, which my family was filled with. I spoke to the group yesterday. On one side of my family of origin, all the uncles and aunts and parents were alcoholic, and there were six of them. And on the other, there were seven of them, I think. And they were all alcoholic. Is there a tendency toward depression in this family? Is there, is, why is everyone self-medicating so extremely? Well, it's because there's something in the genetics and the transmission that is mood disordered. So anyway, I wound up, I wound up doing that and it was very helpful and then things evolved and a lot of grieving happened and then it became not necessary, which is really quite an amazing blessing. But, joy and practice. The human mind, body-mind, is malleable. There's this whole uh, thing called, you know, about neuroplasticity and that the brain can, the brain continues to grow and deteriorate and, and it's, it's a living thing. And that we can affect it 
with what we do with consciousness. Isn't that something? And now, of course, people have known since the time of the Buddha and before that we can alter our consciousness and that we can alter the way we are in the world and that we can become much more happy and functional and loving. And that's known experientially by tens of millions of people. But now we can do the research and PET scans and so on, and we, we sort of think we know why. I think we don't really know why, but we know how to measure it now, which is useful for the people of our ilk. So, if, if human consciousness is developable, what are we developing? And there's this, this beautiful array of mental capacities known as the seven enlightenment factors. There's the five hindrances, which I suggested at the end of the sit, right? There's desire, grasping, wanting, there's aversion, disliking, there's restlessness, agitation, worry, there's sloth and torpor, dullness, there's uh, doubt. Oh, I should just take the moment to do this. It's the perfect. We have, we have so few props in this business. We have sloth and tape here. <laughs> My pals. <laughs> there they are. So, and the mind, the mind is so easily colored by these. It's very natural for us to be caught up. Oh, and, and the, the, the advertising world is so capable of developing desire and the news world is so capable of developing fear and aversion. And we're just pushed around by this, the, by the media. The average child in America sees 15,000 ads by the time they're five years old. 15,000. One, 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 one. So anyway, there's the five hindrances. I don't want to get st stuck there, but with the sloth and tape here, we can <laughs> get. Okay. You guys, go sit on the desk. The, five, the seven enlightenment factors. First, why not develop mindfulness? Mindfulness empowers everything. To, to know what's happening. To be lost in a wandering mind, let's say a familiar depression mind or an anxiety mind, or, to be lost in that and then to wake up and notice, oh, here's the mind doing that. That's freedom. There's a moment of freedom every time there's a moment of mindfulness. And the Buddha discovered, and we can all, probably everyone in this room, most of you anyway, you know it's cultivable. It actually grows. Awareness. Second, curiosity. What an amazing thing to be curious. What's this mind doing? I just woke up. What mood is present? Oh, I'm feeling kind of blue here. Hmm, what's, what's going on inside? That's a very, to become an investigator of the inner world, to go where no human has gone before. It's, it's vast, but to, to notice, oh, I just, I just had this giant dinner, and now I'm feeling like this. Hmm, that's interesting. How, what's that correlation? So to be curious. Or I just saw a homeless person, and... I noticed it, how I wanted to look away, but then I stayed, and then I turned, and then my heart kind of opened, and then I, I felt generous for a moment. That's an interesting thing to notice about oneself. So you're curious about how is this functioning? Or I, I had a beautiful four-day retreat without any media this last week, and. And it was so interesting to watch the withdrawal from news and the, the impulse to check. And there it was, and my phone's always there, and I didn't. But to notice how the impulse to check diminished and how there was just so much more awareness of the world when that storyline, when that melodrama line isn't, isn't constantly asking for another fix, another... Um, but to watch that, to notice that happening. So there's mindfulness, curiosity, persistence or energy. It takes energy to be awake. 
It takes reminders. It takes, it takes being somewhat disciplined about going to your meditation spot and spending the time watching all the impulses to do something, or, and, but then becoming more and more curious. How is this mind unfolding? To, to tolerate the unpleasant states and notice how they pass and they turn into pleasant states. And then, the linchpin, guess what? Joy. Joy, delight, piti, the body filled with delight, or, or simply un, what's the word? Uh, happiness with no external cause. Just happy because a mind that's mindful, curious, and has some energy or persistence is spontaneously delighted, no matter what's happening. That's kind of weird. Didn't even have to buy something. <laughs> so that's, I mean, my primary attribution of how the depression ultimately went away, it comes back briefly, but not for long, it was that the, the meditation developed enough that this capacity of moving to a place of accepting everything that's happening and this emergence of delight, quiet delight, joy, uh, has become much more normative. That little dopamine drip of pleasure, that, that, that which gives us the experience of pleasure, can be cultivated from within, not reliant on somebody else or something else. And then in support of this or further developing, there's concentration. These human minds can be trained to become so concentrated. I mean, way beyond what we think in Western science and psychology. We, we can get the mind to, to the place where at least sometimes it will just come, for instance, home to the breath or home to a loving kindness intention or home to something else and just sit there. That's nice. One of my monk friends described developed concentration as discovering the hammock in the woods. He said, concentration is not a very intelligent state. It's not about thinking at all. It's about a mind that goes to the, pres to the primary object and then goes, I think I'll just climb into this hammock and I'm just going to rest here. A little smile, mm, nice because I don't need anything, because the, the concentration object is sufficient. And if you look in your own life, where do you feel content and happy? It's usually in moments of concentration, like imagine this, a bite of really fine Belgian dark chocolate. <laughs> it's a very intense sensation. And the mind goes briefly. Ah. But it doesn't last long, so you wind up eating the bar very quickly. <laughs> Concentration can be developed. Le supports joy. Concentration, tranquility. Developing a mind which naturally goes to Remember, I think of a tranquil lake or a tranquil ocean scene or a tranquil time in the forest when there's just, it's not necessarily concentrated, but there's no upheaval. Thinking One of the ways that many, many people that I know are really creating anguish for themselves about the world situation and it does look dire, doesn't it? And our political situation is a mess. Not that it's unusual. I mean, this is the nature of political situations over the, you know, as long as humans have been here. But to be able to turn that off and move into tranquility, that when you're, when you're sitting at home in your living room or whatever you're doing, it doesn't help to always be in uproar. 
It simply doesn't help. It creates disease. Disease and medical disease too. So to be able to move into tranquility was one of the, the great gifts of this four days of silence so that I just had the, the, the uproar and the responsibilities and that fell away. And it was so easy to fall into tranquility. Just, ah. And then the seventh enlightenment factor is equanimity. And in equanimity, uh, there's, there's the capacity to accept pleasant and painful, success and failure, happiness, unhappiness, to, to accept it exactly as it is and not struggle. And when you get all seven of these, with the linchpin being this joy, that's, that's actually the, it's with them in place. Not, not only is life really worth living, <laughs> But that's also the place where deep intuitive knowing can happen, deep realizations about the deep nature of things, the true nature of things. So to be capable of, coming specifically to your question, to become com capable of completely being in delight. How nice to meet another person. How are you today? Well, I'm in delight, how are you? Well, I'm in delight too. Great, let's sit here and do nothing together. <laughs> or maybe we have a project we'd like to do together and let's do it with as much joy as we possibly can because we become infectious. And we, we res other people resonate. You know, you know how it's like when you meet, what it's like when you meet someone who's truly happy, truly content. We watched here, we had a, a, a movie evening a week ago last night, and there was an image of um, Joan Halifax, Roshi Joan Halifax, oh, I feel teary, hmm. from Upaya, and uh, she's created an amazing p p program of various kinds. But I met her uh, on this, uh, I met her at s close to 17,000 feet on Mount Kailash, in Tibet, a long time ago now, and uh, we were having some, my partner that I was with at the time was having altitude sickness, and it was a, it was a cold and snowy and difficult circumstance, and there was Joan Halifax, and I had heard she was on the mountain, and I knew who she was immediately, and that meeting was so delicious. And I've, we've crossed paths about four times since, and it's always with this, I had, when I meet her, it's this sense of, oh, oh, I'm seen and known, and life is grand. That's a nice impact she has. She brings that up. That's why she's Roshi Joan Halifax and runs that big scene. So, joy, why not? And why not? Um, some of you know I'm, I, I'm, I love gadgets, and I have a really marvelous PA system. It's a Bose L1. It's a great, small bands use it. And uh, I had it here yesterday. We were doing some movement and dancing. And I took it with me to my hideout at the beach. And uh, on several occasions, that place rocked. <laughs> I'm having this, I, I saw um, Bohemian Rhapsody and I'm having this whole queen thing happening. <laughs> queen and, and some other really rocking uh, guitar folks. And why not dance? Crank up your stereo at home and dance and see what happens. It alters the chemistry in the body. Why not be joyful? And it's no le it can be no less mindful to be just really moving freely with nobody watching. And the enlightenment factors come into balance quite somewhat. It's quite amazing. And joy. It is coming. It's supported from the outside. But you know those waves of feeling that happen sometimes and tears and all that stuff that music can provoke? To provoke that and, and to be with it and to realize this is my life. I have, I have this incredible admiration I wouldn't want to have lived Freddie Mercury's life, but 
that voice. He had four octaves. That capacity to go from here to this soaring openness. Quite something. Why not go there? And in relationship. You know, there are those moments when relationships are going really well. And that, that the, the intimacy's there and, and you're connecting. Why not meet in joy? So yes. Yes to joy and happiness. And there is a price for it. And the price is encountering all the ways that we are identified with suffering. And it's, it's the only game in town as far as I'm concerned, but if, you want, if we really want to be true, not just giddy, but really deeply, contentedly, happily joyful, then we have to really look at how, how much dissatisfaction there's been in our lives and how much grief there is to grieve and, and how insecure things are. Our, when I was, one of the nights I was dancing this last week, um, I was very tearful and I remembered when I got word that my father had died, now, 20 years ago or so more, um, for some reason, I put on some, um, uh, uh, it was vinyl, I think, I think it was vinyl, um, some Peruvian pan flute music, and my kids and I were dancing, dancing and singing and crying in this news, this grief of my dad's death. It was not unexpected, but still it comes as a shock, you know. And uh, there I was dancing in my own solitude a few days ago, and there's this memory that, oh yes, there's this, there's this place of openness which is about joy and grief and happiness and sadness. It's the emotions moving through. And they're moving through in the light of mindfulness. So, the, so the, um, the invitation is to be fully alive. And to be fully alive, of course, we have to let the barriers down and then we get to let them down with other people. And then, then we have a good time with much more joy between us. How's that? Hmm. Where are we at? Oh, almost time to stop. Let's, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there a stack of papers back there with uh, uh, music on it, with a song? Yes. With, uh, Well May the World Go? Yes. Yeah. Could you bring one up here and pass the rest out quickly? Something else that we did for as long as there were humans. We sang together. We made joy together. Thank you. And we've lost that a lot. But we can have it back in a heartbeat. This is a uh, Pete Seeger song. Uh oh. Out of tune, where's the tuner? Ah, here it is. Oh no, then this is. <laughs> I was a ski patrolman in Switzerland for a winter on the Gemstock, the, see, one of the earliest snow mountains. And uh, the ski instructors came from all over Switzerland to train there for a week before the season started. And uh, 
guess what? They all knew all the songs. They sang in, um, whoops, they sang in four languages. And uh, French, German, Italian, and Romanche. Romanche is a little leftover sector of the country over north of Italy. And it's like, uh, like um, Latin. But on the, in, the ch in the cable car going up, they're singing the songs in four parts. <laughs> or over lunch, you know, there's 250 or 300 ski instructors, and they're all singing together. What? <laughs> well, why not? What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> Get my music together here. Kindness chant, isn't it? Pete Seeger. I am having an odd memory. Um, when one when one sees pictures of the great Burmese masters. They always look like they have a toothache. And my experience behind the scenes was that those monks were uh, the, among the happiest people I've ever been around. And uh, I took a picture of the Mahasi Sayadaw, great, I mean like the Dalai Lama of Burmese Buddhism. I, I, he was at Ruth Denison's place and he and the monks were, were alone, not, not alone alone, but they were kind of sequestered. And I got a picture of him laughing. And I had an 8 by 10 print of it on my altar at home. And two of his monks came to visit and uh, stayed in my home. And they saw that picture and they said, oh, where did you get that? And I said, well, I took it <laughs> with a telephoto lens. And they said, he would disapprove. And I said, why would he disapprove? And they said, well, if there's so much suffering in the world, it would be unseemly to be photographed laughing. I thought that was weird. <laughs> I mean, we need the laughter. We need the, because we, we get it all. Here they come. So thank you very much for coming today. Thank you, those of you that are on the internet. Thank you, Kirsten, for your...
care up there. And uh, let's make a big circle. And we'll do a closing. Well, there's a potluck today and the Scrooge show is at 1.30. Now there's a show of transformation, huh? Well, may the world go, the world go, the world go. Are you coming into the kid circle? I am. Oh, good. So I want to invite any of you purported grown-ups to come in and join us. It's really much more fun in here than out there. Hi, sweetie. Come on, that's good, that's good. <laughs> oh. Da, 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 da. All you need is love, love. Not now, thank you. All right. May I hold your hand? Thank you. Can I hold your hand? What a cute little hand. So, these human minds are capable of anything. They can think the most heinous thoughts and the most loving. Let's opt for the latter. <laughs> With this hand that you're holding on the right, why not give it a little squeeze and think a kind thought? This person who is you in a different form, why not give them some blessing? And the same to the left. Think a kind thought, a wish, a prayer. Hmm. And may all beings benefit from our practice. And may I have the microphone, which I forgot up there. Where are we going today? These two? Okay, come on over here. Come on over here. Come sit come sit here. Sit here. Face the candle. You're super close? You want me to hold the microphone? Here. Can you both get close? Hang on. Hang on, let me be sure it's on. Test one, two. Oh yeah, this. One, two, three. Happy, oh, happy, be happy, be happy. Be happy, be happy, sadu, sadu, sadu. Thank you. <laughs> well, let's pull ourselves together here. <laughs> oh, now we get to. Not too close. Come on, now let, let everybody have a good chance. You guys want to get closer? To All right, now I'm going to count. Everyone make your, make your big breathe in and a wish. One, two, three, blow. Yes, we got it. Yay. All right. So do please come and have something to eat. Thank you, those of you that are out on the net. And uh, see you soon, I hope. And don't forget, when you hit the crash bar, conscious.